Philip Mantle, the former director of investigations for the British UFO Research Association, is the Mutual UFO Network's representative for England and is an honorary member of the Research Institute on Anomalous Phenomena in the Ukraine. Philip Mantle has published one book entitled Without Consent, A Study of UFO Abductions in the UK, which he co-authored with Carl Nagaitis. He is an international lecturer on the subject of UFOs and has also worked for a variety of television and radio companies around the world. Not a lot of information came out of the Soviet Union, of course, during the Cold War, and uh, you were able to extract this. Absolutely. I mean, the KGB and the Russian military uh, conducted the biggest UFO study ever anywhere in the world. Uh, it all sparked with a, uh, an incident that took place on the border between the Soviets and China. It was witnessed by many of their military personnel. And so the instructions went out that all, I uh, repeat, all Soviet military personnel, no matter where they were, from the lowest ranking officer, you know, the, 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 the squaddy, sure. the GI, you would call it, we call them squaddies, uh, to, the, to the official military brass, every single one of them were part of the project, and they had to report anything and everything they saw. And when you think of the Soviet military machine at the time, how many individual people were involved, and then it's the biggest UFO study ever conducted. And the KGB did go out and, and um, conduct interviews, mainly with the, um, the military and civilian population, more, more so the pilots and that kind of thing, but not, not exclusively. And after the fall of the, the Soviet Empire, of course, this, a lot of this material was released. Uh, it was actually a former... Uh, Soviet t pilot and cosmonaut who, who, who started the ball rolling and got some of the information released. And, of course, the KGB files, although we've only touched the surface, they are there and they have been translated into English. People have often asked me, is there a cover-up? And I would have to say, yes, there is. I mean, it's easy to prove. Cover-up means the, with, with, you know, the withholding of information for whatever purpose. And, and, and it's easily provable. I mean, and so why they keep it secret, I don't know. Uh, I mean, the obvious thing is that we are being visited by extraterrestrials, and they don't want the the, uh, the population to know for whatever reason, for political and social reasons, I mean, a whole host of reasons. You know, some say that the Germans had uh, UFO technology. That's why they were so ahead at the time during World War II. We were fortunate enough to, uh, you know, have the ability to, 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 to beat them, but that they had this ability and that their scientists were working on it. And that's why, of course, the uh, Soviets at the time and us both benefited with the German scientists for our own individual space programs. Absolutely. I mean, Operation Paperclip. Um, I mean, after the war, you know, the spoils of war were, were, were many and varied, but one of those spoils was you know, the German scientists. The Soviets got their pick as well of the German scientists. There's two rumours here that you can work on. Is one that the technology we see was purely in, uh, uh, invented by the German scientists, nothing else. It was it was their technology that they worked on over the years. Which is possible. Which is possible. Or, B, that the technology was not theirs, but they'd got it from elsewhere, i.e. from extraterrestrials, one way or another, but they had adapted it, reversed engineered it, or were trying to do that, hadn't quite succeeded, and of course the war ended, and the U.S. and the Soviet took over where the Germans left off, taking the scientists with them, of course, who worked on it. I tried to track a, a chap down here in the U.K., I mean, in, in the country of Wales here, it's known as the valleys, there's lots of small little valleys and little rural yeah. areas, and he was, um, he was from Poland, he was a Polish immigrant who'd settled here uh, after the war, and he claimed to have worked at one of these establishments making a flying saucer. Philip, tell us more about this individual from Poland who claims that he was uh, helping to make uh, craft, UFO craft. Got a colleague of mine by the name of Margaret Fry. Now, Margaret uh, lived in Wales, uh, a well-known and active uh, UFO researcher was Margaret. I was staying with Margaret um, um, for, for, for a few days, and she told me the story of um, a, a Polish immigrant who lived in the valleys of Wales. Now, Margaret had personally interviewed him, and he said that uh, during the Second World War, um, he was um, in a, at a forced labor camp, but not one of these huge, great big things like the, like the concentration camps. This was a, for, a small forced labor camp uh, where he was a, a, an engineer, but not, not high tech. This was, this was a nuts and bolts kind of engineering right. uh, chap. And he'd been forced to work there. And, and one of the things that they'd actually built was a flying saucer. You know, the typical type of thing, the domed disc. Um, but it wasn't, you know, uh, weird technology was 
purely man-made technologies. Was, there certainly was nuts and bolts and it had an engine and that kind of thing. Um, the location of which I never managed to, uh, to get from, from Margaret. And, um, and, and, you know, he worked there through, throughout, throughout the Second World War. He was, he was captured when, uh, when the Germans invaded Poland uh, and, and forced to work there under extreme conditions. So we set off to try and find him again in some of the small rural communities. I can't remember his name now, but um, I know the type of name it was because my, my, my stepfather is, is Polish. Whilst there were a number of individuals conf confirmed he was there, he, he lived locally. They couldn't quite remember where he lived. He, he was, he was an, an old chap by this time, and he was, he was a bit of a chameleon. He tended to blend into the background. He was a, a, a local character, if yeah. you like. Um, but he was certainly there. There was no question about it. He'd moved from one village to another. Uh, after the war, like, like, like my stepfather did, he went down the coal mines, um, you know, and, and uh, used his engineering skills in that respect. Um, that, that particular area of Wales uh, had nothing but mines. You know, it was a coal mining community. And so he was known by some of his ex-colleagues, spoke to a couple of them, and they remembered him, they knew who he was, but he'd moved on to another village, and uh, he'd worked down the mines with them, and, and they told us the story that, you know, he told them exactly the same, that, you know, there was him and a number of others, you know, a small group of men um, worked in difficult conditions, but they worked on a flying saucer. He, he was, you would probably call it more of a kind of a blacksmith type of engineer, nuts and bolts, you know, steel, girders, rivets, that kind of thing, but they were certainly built one, uh, and it flew. You know, there's no no question that it was just left there in a hangar or you know somewhere. It did it it, it did fly. What it was used for, what they were doing with it, etc. They weren't party to that kind of information. You know, they were literally slave labour. But a fascinating story, nonetheless. And uh, I'm I'm just sorry I didn't get to the chance to speak to him in person, but I certainly tried. It's um, a very rural community, and they they, they look on outsiders like me with uh, an air of suspicion anyway. Sure. How well fortunate did... fortunate that Margaret lived in the area and she was able to speak. She, did, she interviewed him. Margaret did interview the chap in question. But it's um, a fascinating uh, a side issue to the whole UFO subject. It really is. How well did it fly, Philip? Do you know? I don't know. All I knew is that it was capable of flying. It did take off. It was manned by, you know, the, the, the German officers at the time, and it did take off. It, it flew. Uh, to what degree, to what capability, no idea. They, they weren't allowed to know. You know, they were they did their job, asked no questions, and were just grateful to get some food at the end of the day, uh, and that was it. We can't prove conclusively that it's one thing or another. There's evidence. You have to weigh up what that evidence is. Like you go to court, George, and you present your evidence, and the jury then decides what that represents. Sure. And the same is the UFO is is there with the UFO phenomena. We can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt it is there. So we have a few theories, if you like. One, the most popular, is that the UFO phenomena is extraterrestrial. It is literally nuts and bolts vehicles coming from A to B, one way or another, whether it's through a dimension, through a wormhole, oh, or sure. just, you know, putting rocket fuel in of some kind, you know, or, or whether it's Star Trek technology that gets them yeah. here, but they come. But they're getting here. But they're here. Another is that what we are witnessing is some kind of, they call it, I think it's called the federal hypothesis. It's kind of fallen away over the last few years. But we're looking at secret military technology. It's got nothing to do with aliens or, or anything from anywhere else. It is the powers that be experimenting. And, and of course, the perfect cover-up is to call it a flying saucer from Mars, and everybody walks away laughing and joking and takes no notice of it whatsoever. So that is one idea. In the UK, and I think it's predominantly in the UK and Europe rather than in America, uh, the idea is that we are looking at balls of light that are made by the Earth. Um, the, the, the phenomenon of, of, of earthquake lights is well known. When there's an earthquake, there's kind of a, a glow of lights rather than balls of plasma. But certain locations around the world, as I mentioned Marfa in Texas, we have the Pennine Hills of the north of England, and various other locations, the Hest Island Valleys of, 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 of Norway, seem to have these lights in great profusion. They're not just now they go back decades, they go back centuries, they've always been there. The theory is, and it's, it's been largely put forward by Michael Persinger in, in Canada, uh, Dr. Michael Persinger, mm -hmm. that when you get too close to these lights, they are electrically charged and it basically muddles your brain. It scrambles your brains. Permanently? Yeah, not permanently, temporarily. Right. You can still function, you can still you know, walk, talk, drive the car, but you have some, I call, it a, I call it an hallucination for want of a better word, but it's not an hallucination in its, in its strictest sense. 
but you have an, an, an otherworldly experience and you interpret that experience in the technology of the day and the folklore of the day. So today we have aliens in spaceships. 200 years ago we had fairies, you know, a thousand years ago, it would have been, you know, armies in right. the sky. And it could have been a thousand years ago, it would have been, you know, he heavenly chariots, whatever. All the same. But it's all the same. But you just interpret it in the, the, the technology of, of that particular era. And it's an interesting idea, but I'm not sure. It, it, I'm, I believe it can explain some things, but, but, but not the whole lot. Because what, what that theory does, of course, it rules out the photographs. We have good photographs of structured objects not balls of light we have pictures of balls of light as well of course sure but we have photographs of structured craft vehicles now those vehicles are either our own somebody here on earth has built them you know you know, put rivets in them and an engine and, and flown them or they're not ours they come from off planet and it's really down to those two and you have to judge the evidence yourself 